Logo, Indeed. Text. At Indeed Eng. Tech Talks at Indeed's Austin headquarters. Engineering.indeed.com. Welcome to tonight's talk about RAD and how we replicate terabytes of data around the world every day. I'm Jason Copy, one of the system administrators here at Indeed. Presentation slide with a bar graph. Title, Unique Visitors Per Millions. From 2009 to 2015, it measures 0 to 180 million visitors. Each year, the count steadily increases, up from 20 million. Text, 64% of U.S. job searchers search on Indeed each month. 80.2 million unique U.S. visitors per month. 16 million jobs. Indeed is the number one external source of hire. We help over 180 million job seekers look for jobs in over 50 countries and 28 different languages. And I help people get jobs by ensuring that our sites are up and fast all the time. In general at Indeed, we build systems that are fast, simple, resilient, and scalable. And let me tell you a little bit more about what I think about uh, when I think about fast as a system administrator. When a job seeker looks for a job on Indeed, we want to make sure to show them the most recently posted jobs on the web. So as soon as that job is available on the web, we want it to be available on Indeed. New slide, an Indeed job search page. There are results for software engineer in Austin, Texas. The first listing is Junior Software Development Engineer. Text, new. Timestamp, just posted. Then, new slide with a line graph. Title, Job Search Browser Rendering. From February 24th to March 8th, it measures 0 to 800 milliseconds. Text, median, about 0 0.5 seconds. And, we want that page to render as quickly as possible. Today, it takes about a half of a second for that search engine results page to render in the browser. And from the very beginning, we like to start things as simply as possible. In 2004, we, uh, la when we launched, we had just a few servers that were uh, searching jobs in the United States only, and we had about 1.8 million jobs. And the infrastructure that we were running was also pretty simple. We had an aggregation engine that would crawl the webs from the job, and then store those jobs in a MySQL server. MySQL is a relational database which is typically accessed across the network, but MySQL is not fast at full text search. MySQL is not a search engine. In particular, it's not fast at searching unstructured text and providing ranked results. By the time Indeed launched in 2004, there was another technology that had become the industry standard for search called Lucene. New slide, a partial timeline. Text, 1999, Lucene. 2004, Indeed. Lucene is a high-performance, full-featured text search engine library, and it's really fast. And one of the ways that it's able to be fast is that it's not a remote database like MySQL. The files for Lucene must be stored on the local disk of the application server, or in our case, our job search engine. A typical way that you would build a Lucene index is to have a process that is reading from a data source like MySQL, and then writing out the Lucene index to the local file system. However, in our case, we knew that we were going to need many servers to keep the site up and fast all the time. New slide. Text indicates the local file system is called forward slash data forward slash job index. On the next slide, a cylinder labeled MySQL has four arrows extending outward. They point to four identical boxes, with index builders and local file systems inside. So we could have just run our Lucene Index Builder on all of our search engine servers, but we felt like this was kind of a waste. We were going to be redoing the same work over and over and over again on many different servers, and this could potentially uh, crush our MySQL server. So we wondered if there was a way we could just build the index once and then ship that to our search engine servers. So this is the kind of architecture that we decided to go with, where we would have one index builder that was reading from MySQL, creating the job index, and then copying that job index to our search servers. And as we started to think about this design, we realized that it could work for kind of really any combination of data, not just the original use case for our Lucene job data. And so this is our search engine results page today. New slide, an Indeed search results page for software engineer in Austin, Texas. The Luc original Lucene index that I was just describing with some extra model information provides the job search engine 
that we use today. Please mark the area to sort and filter search results as Lucene plus model. And another set of data, a bit set, tells us whether or not a job is sponsored. Indeed flags the top two results with the text, sponsored. He marks this as bit set. The first listing also has a four-star rating and 1,328 reviews. He marks these as Lucene plus custom binary. A different Lucene index and some companion custom binary data tells us if a company has reviews. And some other data that's in JSON and CSV tells us whether or not a company is a featured employer. So going back to the design that we had decided to go with, uh, because we were going to be able to ship any kind of data around, we wanted to have generic names for the different components. And these are the names that we came up with. New slide, a diagram. Three separate boxes with arrows connecting them from left to right. Text, database server, producer, consumers. Within the producer and consumers boxes, there is the text, artifact. In our system, an artifact is read-optimized data that is stored in a directory on the file system. A producer is something which creates or updates a data artifact. And a consumer is something which reads an artifact. And we felt like this produce once and consume many times model had many different benefits. The first of which is that we minimize our database access. So we, we could uh, reduce the load that we're putting on our, on our database server. Next, we were only computing the artifact once, so we weren't redoing the same work over and over and over again on our different search servers. Next, we could scale the number of consumers independently than the number of producers or database servers that we had. And this is nice because typically database server hardware is more expensive with really fast drives and a lot of memory. And it meant that we could make our consumer machines run on commodity hardware, which is typically cheaper. And also by having the producer and consumer on separate machines, we had separate code deployables, which meant that the development teams had a little bit more agility in releasing these, these code bases. And so we were feeling pretty good about this model of produce once and consume many times. Uh, but we still needed a way to ship the data between our producer and consumer machines. And we decided on the simple utility rsync. You've heard me talk about rsync before in another uh, Indeed Eng tech talk. Uh, and it's written about in our blog uh, on a topic of log repo. But rsync is an efficient point-to-point -point file transfer utility that can mirror data between directories on one server and another server. And it only copies the differences between those two directories. New slide with the job listing from earlier. Text. Junior Software Development Engineer. New. Timestamp. Just posted. And because we really wanted to keep jobs fresh on the site and updated throughout the day, we knew that our consumers were going to need to reload this data regularly throughout the day. And just in case there was a problem, we wanted to be able to roll back to a previous copy of our data. And because we want the site to be up and fast all the time, a data reload shouldn't interrupt job seeker requests. So all of this led us to believe that we needed some form of artifact versioning. And so we started as simply as possible. For each new version of an artifact, we created a new directory. The directory name has the artifact name and an incrementing version number. New slide. Title. New directory for new version. Text. Jobindex.1, Jobindex.2, Jobindex.3. Next, we use something called a symlink to create a reference to the current version of the artifact. A symlink is, in a Unix-like uh, file system, it's just a reference to another file or directory. In this case, you can see the job index.latest is pointing to the third version of the job index. And as we downloaded new data to the machine, all we would have to do to cause the consumer to reload the data is update the job index.latest symlink to point to the new version of the job index. Slide title, load new data, text job index dot latest with an arrow pointing to job index dot four. Or if we wanted to roll back to a previous version, we would just change where the job index dot latest symlink points to. Unfortunately, we had a problem because every new version was taking up disk space and took, taking time to create the new version. New slide, a linear line graph. Title, normal disk copy. It measures total bytes on disk versus versions. 
the line goes upward and to the right at the same rate. As we were increasing the number of versions, we, would, we were also increasing the amount of bytes that we needed uh, in our hard drives. And over time, this also increased our disk latency, which made the amount of time it would take to create a new version increase over time as well. Text labeling the graph line. Disk latency. Version create time. There's no other change in the graph. All metrics progress at the same rate. And even though we had almost 2 million jobs in the, in the, in the index, we, and we wanted to be updating these jobs throughout the day, we weren't updating or changing all of the jobs throughout the day. We were only changing a small percentage of them. New slide. Text 1.8 million jobs. Change less than 2% per hour. So imagine that we had, at the beginning of the day, a few million jobs in our job index. And then later in the day, our aggregation engine notices that there are some change jobs and some new jobs. Those changed and new jobs should be the only modifications that we need to make to our job index. And that means that the, the vast majority of the job index is, is unchanged. And so we looked at this and thought that, this, that it would be really nice if we had a way to make incremental updates to our artifacts. And that uh, this would be great for the job index, but potentially nice for other uh, data that we'd be shipping around as well. And we figured we could save some disk space and time if we were able to make these kinds of incremental updates. So we sought out to find a way to share data between the different versions of our artifacts. So let's imagine that we have the first version of our job index, and it has three different files. Each file is exactly one gigabyte in size. New slide, a diagram. A box labeled job index.1 contains the files file1.bin, file2.bin, and file3.bin. Text 3 gigabytes. When we want to make the second version, we create a copy. A box labeled job index.2 contains the same three files and a new file4.bin. Text 4 gigabytes. And in this case, we're making a tiny incremental update to the index by adding a new 1 gigabyte file. And we continue to make these copy and incremental updates throughout the day. And you can see that each individual job index is 3 gigabytes, 4 gigabytes, and 5 gigabytes, respectively. New slide with the same diagrams. A box labeled job index.3 contains the four previous files and a new file5.bin. Text 5 gigabytes. But together, when you sum them all up, they add up to 12 gigabytes. So if we use symlinks to have references between the unchanged files and the different versions of our job index, we would save a lot on disk space, uh, down to 5 gigabytes from the previous 12 gigabytes. New slide with diagrams. Text. Job index.1, 3 gigabytes. Job index.2, 1 gigabyte. Job index.3, 1 gigabyte. However, we have a problem as soon as we delete the first version of our job index because files 1, 2, and 3 are now removed from the file system. With symlinks, when you remove the referenced file of a symlink, the data is removed from the file system. Fortunately, there's another type of link in the file system called a hard link, which is an additional name for an existing file. And now I know what you're thinking. The hard link and symlink kind of sound pretty similar, but there's a key difference. With the hard link, we have the same type of references between the files which are unchanged between the different versions. However, the key difference is that when you remove the first version of the hard-linked job index, the remaining versions stay intact. New slide with the same diagrams. He deletes job index.1. Text. Job index.2, 4 gigabytes. Job index.3, 1 gigabyte. Then he deletes job index 2. Text. Job index.3, 5 gigabytes. And this is because you can think of hard links kind of like ref counting. And only when you remove the last hard link from the file system is the data removed from the file system. So with symlinks and hard links and using rsync to copy between our servers, we had fast and efficient artifact versions. And this allowed us to keep the jobs fresh on the site. With the single producer and many consumers concept, we, it allowed us to scale where we needed it the most on our search engine servers, which allowed us to keep the site fast. New slide, a line graph. Title, job search browser rendering. Text, 
Median, about 0.5 seconds. Uh, today, it's around half of a second for the page to load. And so we built this system with our design principles in mind, and it allowed us to grow throughout the years. By 2008, we had expanded job search into six different countries. 2009, we were making a significant effort to expand job search into 23 different countries. And by 2009, the number of jobs that we were adding or modifying each month grew to 22.5 million, up from the 1.8 million in the early days. In order for us to provide a great experience for all job seekers around the world, in 2009, along with the expansion to more countries, we added our second data center. The second data center was in Europe, which is closer to a, a growing percentage of the job seekers that were using Indeed, which allowed search to be faster for them and a faster, more responsive website is a better experience for our job seekers. So we needed to adapt our rsync system to work in the multi-data center setup. New slide, a diagram. Title, multi-DC, rsync. There are three separate boxes, DC1, DC2, and DC3. Inner text of DC1. Producer. Inner text of DC2 and DC3. Staging. And as we started to think about it, we knew that we wanted uh, multi-data center rsync to work with any number of data centers, not just that initial second data center. And we wanted to minimize the amount of internet bandwidth that we were uh, using in between our data centers. And so we introduced this concept, uh, a, new co a new component called a staging server. The staging server is responsible for downloading all of the artifacts from the original data center so that the consumers in the new data centers can download from their data center local staging server. And this concept of the staging server is kind of similar to the concept of produce once, consume many. Uh, if we can just minimize the expensive operations, let's try that. And this allowed us to grow for a few more years. In 2011, we ex expanded job search into 52 different countries, and we had servers in four different data centers around the world. And the number of jobs that we were adding or modifying each month continued to grow up to 32.5 million in 2011. And then we started to experience some growing pains with the rsync system. Initially, to keep things very simply, simple, between the data centers, we copied artifacts serially, or we copied artifacts one at a time. New slide, a diagram. Two boxes, DC1 with producer and DC2 with staging. Each has artifacts, with an arrow between them. The slide shifts. Text. Problem, serially can cause delays. Now DC1 artifacts say, new. DC2 artifacts say, old. However, if we had a, a large artifact that was being copied, and, and maybe the internet link between these two data centers was a little bit slower than usual, we could back up or delay other artifacts from replicating into our, our other data centers. And so the workaround that we, we put in place for this is we started to copy artifacts in separate streams. New slide, a diagram. Two boxes. DC1 producer broken up into three separate artifacts. Large 1, large 2, and small. DC2 staging is identical. Three arrows point between the corresponding artifacts. In this example, I'm showing how large 1 artifact and large 2 artifact are copied in their own streams independently of everything else. And then the remainder of these smaller artifacts are, are copied in, in one of those more traditional serial streams. And this was fine as a workaround, but it meant that our, our systems administrators had to make the decision every time a new artifact was added into the system, should this new artifact replicate in its own stream, or should it go in another stream that, that's already out there? New slide, a diagram. Four boxes, DC1, DC2, DC3, and DC4. DC1 has individual arrows pointing to each of the others. The slide shifts. He replaces the arrow between DC1 and DC2 with the text. Down. Initially, because rsync is point to point, we only had one connection between our original data center and each of the newer data centers. And this is generally fine as long as everything on the internet is working OK. But what would sometimes happen, sometimes at 3 AM, or sometimes at 5 p.m. on a Saturday when the system administrator is out to dinner, is the link between the original data center would uh, go down in between the original data center and one of these newer data centers. Um, and, and what had to happen at that point is the, the system administrator would respond 
see what connectivity was working and manually reconfigure the replication path to take a different route. Uh, not a very sustainable uh, recovery model. New slide with a diagram. Title, workaround. Shift replication path. Four boxes, DCs one through four. DC one has arrows pointing to only three and four. DC three has an arrow pointing to DC two. In the very beginning, when we had just a handful of consumers that were downloading from a single producer machine, everything was fine, and we could grow the number of our search engine servers pretty nicely. New slide. Title, scale. Few consumers with our sync. But over time, we added many, many more consumers. And what this caused was the network on the producer server to be 100% used. New slide. Title, problem. Too many consumers with our sync. And this meant that it took longer for us to send that data artifact to the consumers. And some consumers would get it before the others. And this just wasn't good. So the very simple workaround in this case is to add more network bandwidth. And this works up to an extent. Uh, and, and this is what we did initially. Another way that we worked around this problem was by adding what we call a staging tier. And this is very similar to the staging servers that I just talked about. But in this case, the staging tier is responsible for downloading the artifacts from the single producer machine. And then the consumers kind of load balance their downloads on the staging servers, thus not to overwhelm any individual server. And so while we were able to grow the use of the rsync system and continue to add artifacts into it, it was requiring system administrator intervention to configure and to maintain and to respond to, to problems. And 2014, we saw a lot of growth in the rsync system over the, the previous 10 years. We had 100 different artifacts in the rsync system, and the systems administrators were manually configuring to add a new producer to the system every month and configuring what servers needed to download that artifact and what staging tiers needed to download that artifact. And at the time, we were producing 1,761 terabytes of data a month. We had over 200 unique consumers, and our systems administrators were adding around two a month, again, having to configure which servers those consumers run on, which artifacts they need, making sure the staging tiers had those artifacts. And we were replicating over 21,000 terabytes of data per month. Text. Replicating over 21,931 terabytes per month. The systems administrators were adding or reconfiguring the staging tiers or adding network bandwidth quarterly. And we were responding to problems on the internet by modifying the replication path monthly. And all of this was just really feeling like we were requiring too much intervention from our systems administration team to maintain and respond to problems in this infrastructure. And while the number of systems administrators in 2014 grew by 50%, the number of developers in 2014 grew by 100%. Slide with a bar chart. It indicates that the increases happened between January and December. So, you know, the, the, the thought of having our systems administrators have to respond more and more and more to maintain this system, uh, it, just, it just wasn't really sitting very well with us. So in 2014, I, I think I can say that we were really feeling the scalability limits of our 10-year-old rsync system. And uh, Julie, my co-presenter, is going to come up next and describe the system that she and her team designed deployed and continue to iter on, iterate on today that uh, deals with some of these limitations. Jason steps away from the podium and Julie walks up, taking his place. Hello, my name is Julie Scully. I'm a software engineer here at Indeed. And I help people get jobs by ensuring that our job data is complete and current. I've spent most of my time at Indeed working on the job search backend team, and that team produces a lot of data. So we have both large and small artifacts. They're updated frequently throughout the day and need to be replicated all around the world. And our team was also feeling the strains of our rsync system. So after first confirming that it was a fundamental limitation with the technology that we were using and not something we could continue to iterate on in the existing system, I set out to design a replacement. Initially, I was calling it resilient artifact distribution. My goal was to focus on the resiliency aspects. Uh, however, the acronym was a lot cooler, so today we just call it RAD. 
With RAD, we wanted to preserve as many of the positive aspects of the R-Sync system uh, that we could while addressing some of the scalability and functional limitations. So we had a few initial design goals. We wanted to minimize the network bottlenecks. We wanted to preserve the loose coupling between the producer and the consumers. We wanted to build in as much automatic recovery as possible. We wanted to empower our developers to have more control over their replication paths and spread that load out so it wasn't concentrated with our systems administrators. And finally, we wanted to provide good system-wide visibility. So the most critical thing we needed to solve were these network bottlenecks. The biggest scale problem we were experiencing with RSync was that outbound network connection from the primary producer machine. So this was the first thing we, we started looking at. RSync is a point-to-point -point download, so that means either that primary producer machine has to do a lot of work, or we're going to introduce additional latency with those staging tiers or other fan-out points. So we were pretty sure we needed to move away from a point-to-point -point download system. New slide. Text. No more point-to-point. -point. Thinking about other efficient ways to transfer data around the internet, one of the things that came up was BitTorrent. And so we thought, well, you know, maybe BitTorrent is for more than just pirating movies. <laughs> slide with a picture of Bart Simpson in front of a blackboard, scowling. He's written over and over, I will not illegally download this movie. So... BitTorrent is a peer-to-peer -peer communication protocol, so it can very efficiently transfer large data between a lot of consumers. So this seemed like this would be a, a potential candidate, but we wanted to make sure that it would work for our use cases. New slide. Title, BitTorrent. Would it work? Text. Sample replication to three consumers. Measure time and network traffic. We were able to find an open source Java implementation of BitTorrent, <clears throat> excuse me, on the web, and we wanted to set up a sample replication. So we were going to, to replicate data from a single producer out to three consumers. And doing that, we wanted to measure both the network time, the network traffic, and the time it took to download and compare that to our rsync system. So we created a 700 megabyte artifact, and we performed that replication. New slide with a two column table. Title. Network test. Text. Total megabytes received plus transmitted for 700 megabytes artifact. The first column is machine. The second is rsync. The producer machine has an rsync rate of 2,240 megabytes. Consumer machines 1 through 3 have a rate of about 750. As you might expect when the rsync case, <clears throat> that primary producer machine had network bandwidth of about three times the size of that artifact because it needed to provide every byte to all three of those consumers. And each consumer had network traffic that was roughly a little bit larger than the size of the artifact that it needed to download. The slides shifts, adding a third column to our table. This column is BitTorrent. The producer machine has a BitTorrent rate of 782 megabytes. Consumer machines 1 through 3 have a rate of about 1,200. You can see how different the numbers look for BitTorrent. So in BitTorrent, that primary producer machine now only generated the network traffic that would download slightly more than one copy of the artifact. And the three consumers now actually had quite a bit more network traffic, but still not even twice the size of the artifact that it was downloading. So that traffic was much more evenly distributed, and no one machine was bearing the majority of the work. We wanted to be careful, though, that we weren't just increasing overall network traffic. So looking at the total, you can see that actually rsync and BitTorrent produced the same total network traffic while more evenly distributing that work. The rsync total is 4,481 megabytes. The BitTorrent total is 4,480 megabytes. So this seemed like it was pretty promising from a network perspective. As well, it was substantially faster. So in that test, the rsync download took about 24 minutes, and the BitTorrent download took five and a half minutes. So before I go on to how we use BitTorrent, I want to cover some of the implementation details. What BitTorrent does when it's going to have a download, whether there's a single large artifact or multiple, uh, single large file or multiple files, it basically puts all of the files together as if it was one large set of data, and then breaks that data up into small pieces of equal size. Each piece can then be individually hashed so that the consumer can validate the contents that it downloaded. So if we look at a job index example, in this case there's three files 
and each file has a slightly different size. New slide. A box labeled job index.1 contains file 1.bin at 100 megabytes, file 2.bin at 200 megabytes, and file 3.bin at 50 megabytes. Treating that as one large chunk of data, we could break it up into pieces like this. So with a piece size of 75 megabytes, we'd end up with five pieces. Four of those pieces are complete. The fifth piece is actually an incomplete piece. The four complete pieces of data are 75 megabytes each, while the incomplete fifth piece is only 25 megabytes. And the other thing to note here is that some of the pieces only contain data from a single file, but some of the pieces actually span file boundaries. The primary producer machine that's going to provide this torrent then needs to create a metadata file. And this file is typically has a .torrent extension. And it is used by both the producer and the consumer to uh, notify what the data is in that download. So here's what a torrent metadata file might look like. At the top, there's a file manifest. So it lists the name of every file in that artifact and the size of each of those files. New slide. Title, dot torrent metadata file. Text within curly brackets. Files, colon. File 1 dot bin, 100 megabytes, semicolon, and so on. It specifies the piece length. This is very important because that consumer needs to be able to recreate these files from these independent pieces that it's downloading. Text within curly brackets. Piece length, colon, 75 megabytes. And finally, something referred to as the info hash. This is the unique hash for each of the pieces in that download. And the info hash can kind of be used as a unique key that describes the contents of this download. This info hash has five separate strings of letters within curly brackets, separated by semicolons. A tracker is the coordinator of the download, so it can help, help connect producer and consumers. And a seeder is any client which is providing data. And one thing to note about a seeder is, a seeder does not need to contain the entire contents of the data artifact in order to be seeding. So even if it just has one or two pieces of the entire artifact, it could still provide those pieces to other potential consumers. So let's take a look at how this would work. So in this case, the primary seeder has the entire data artifact on its disk, and it's created the torrent metadata file. New slide, a diagram. Two circles, Cedar and Tracker. An arrow from Cedar to Tracker with the text, I have pieces for info hash. It can then use the info hash from that torrent metadata file as a unique key and announce out to the tracker that it has data for this particular info hash. The slide shifts. The tracker has an arrow pointing back to Cedar with the text, OK. The tracker can keep a simple in-memory map that tracks all of the info hashes that it knows about to the list of peers that have notified the tracker that they have some of that data. And then it can acknowledge back to the seeder that it's accepted that request. A consumer is any client who is downloading data. So how does that consumer get the very first piece of that torrent onto its disk? New slide, with a similar diagram. Title, how a consumer gets the first piece. Two circles, consumer and tracker. An arrow from consumer to tracker with the text, peers for info hash. Well, first, it needs to have that torrent metadata file so that it can identify the info hash for that torrent. It then can talk to that same tracker and use the info hash to request the set of peers that might have data for that. The slide shifts. The tracker has an arrow pointing back to consumer with the text, peer list. This is a quick memory lookup for the tracker, so it can easily reply back to that consumer with the peer list. New slide, with a similar diagram. Title, it is also a seeder. Two circles, consumer slash seeder, and tracker. The consumer can then go out, directly connect to those peers, and download the data. And as soon as it's downloaded even a single piece of this data, it can turn around and start announcing to the tracker that it could also act as a seeder. So at that point, the tracker could direct new potential consumers to this consumer to share data. This sort of flurry of activity that happens as consumers identify each other, start connecting to each other and share data, is referred to as a swarm. New slide, a diagram. Title, swarm. Four boxes, consumer one, consumer two, consumer three, and cedar. Arrows point to and from each, interconnecting them. The consumer boxes have the inner text. Seating as it downloads. 
So this looked pretty good, but the BitTorrent out of the box didn't quite meet our needs. So as Jason described, a lot of our artifacts share data between subsequent versions. And we wanted to make sure that we only downloaded the changed data in any particular artifact. So we needed to make sure that BitTorrent could do this for us. New slide, a diagram. Once again, the box labeled job index.1, containing three .bin files broken into five data pieces. The pieces are hash one through five, correspondingly. Let's go back and look at this job index example. So here, we have our three files, and we can see the hash for each piece. And so each piece is going to have a unique hash because they contain unique data. Imagine that job index two is published and made available, and it adds a new file at the end. So file four is new data, but files one through three are unchanged. New slide with job index.2. It contains three original files and the new file 4.bin, 50 megabytes, at the bottom. The slide shifts. When the files get broken into pieces, job index 2 has an additional sixth piece. However, its piece 5 now says hash 6, and piece 6 says hash 7. When we go to hash uh, the pieces for job index version 2, you can see here pretty quickly that pieces 1 through 4 contain identical data as they did in the first version the hashes are going to match. So only pieces five and six are going to contain a new hash. So it would be relatively straightforward to compare the torrent metadata file from the first two versions of the index and identify which are the new hashes and only download that data. So with this technique, we could only download pieces five and six. However, what happens if the new file that's added is named file zero and it's going to sort to the top? Well, that's going to shift all of the other files down and all the pieces are not going to match. When she names file 4.bin, file 0 instead, it moves to the top of job index 2. Now the index's six pieces are hash 6 through 11. So we wouldn't be able to easily identify that we already have some of this data. Now I know what you're thinking, well, just control the sort order. Like if you sort by last modified date, you could guarantee that those new files sort to the bottom of the list. And while that's true, that still doesn't actually meet our needs because we don't just have brand new files added. Sometimes an existing file is written as new data, and so it could be the case that file one is overwritten as a new file one, which is now a different size. The original file one.bin in job index one is 100 megabytes. The new file one.bin in job index two is 150 megabytes. Comparing the two, the new one takes up about one data piece more than before. So if this was our case, and we were sorting alphabetically, file one is going to push the rest of those pieces down, and none of the pieces are going to match. If we wanted to sort by last modified date, that's great. File one would get picked out and moved to the bottom, but none of the pieces are still going to match. So there is actually no way that we could sort the files to guarantee that we maximize the identical piece hashes from one version to the next. We also thought, well, maybe we could hash each file individually. So if we didn't allow the pieces to span file boundaries, then we could guarantee that from one version to the next, a file that was unchanged would, would have some pieces that matched. However, this would be an efficiency cost. Some of our artifacts contain hundreds of files, and if we didn't allow the pieces to span file boundaries, we would end up with hundreds of incomplete piece segments. That means there would just be more total pieces, there'd be more connections and downloads that would have to happen, and that would be an efficiency trade-off we didn't want to make. So we went back and looked at how rsync handles this. rsync compares files and not pieces. Now, of course, pieces is a BitTorrent concept. So when looking at files, rsync considers two files to be identical if they have the same name and size and last modified date. RSync does have a checksum capability uh, so that they could validate the contents, but we've never enabled that in production because that would be a large CPU hit to our over already overburdened primary producer machines. So as long as we could compare files in the same way that RSync does by default, that would work for our use case. So we went back and looked at that torrent metadata file, and it already contained the file name and size. New slide. Title. Dot torrent metadata file contents. Text between curly brackets. Files, colon, file 1.bin, 100 megabytes, date time, semicolon. And so on. So by making a small change and adding the last modified date in that file manifest, 
we would then be able to compare files in the same way that our sync does. New slide with a diagram. Two boxes, job indexes one and two. A line with the text match. Connects the corresponding files one, two, and three in each index. The data piece names now describe which files they contain instead of using numbered hashes. For example, text piece one, file zero, file one, piece two, file one. So with that additional information, we could compare the two torrent metadata files and identify that between job index one and two, files one through three in this case are identical. Then instead of looking at the hashes for the piece, we could look at the bytes of files that each piece contains. So in this case, pieces two through six only contain data from files one through three. So we could pretty quickly identify that we don't need to download that data. We already have all of that data available to us. And we only need to download piece one to completely have job index two on our local file system. So with this change to our BitTorrent protocol, we felt confident that it would meet our needs for a replication technology. New slide, title, BitTorrent evaluation result. It's substantially faster than rsync. It drastically reduces the network load on that producer machine, which is going to make it much more horizontally scalable as we expect to continue to grow over time. So then we started looking at how to design a system to make sure we preserved that loose coupling between the producers and the consumers. At Indeed, we typically have a service-oriented service architecture, and so we knew we wanted to design probably a multi-service approach. And we were inspired by a river. New slide, an illustration. It's a river twisting down hills into a larger body of water. So data, or I'm sorry, water flowing through a river is a lot like data flowing through our production infrastructure from producers to consumers. So we named our services after river components. So a headwater is the beginning of the river, and headwater is the first step in our data replication flow. It's what publishes new data into our system. A data producer is any application that is running in our production environment and wants to write data to disk that would be available for replication. After a data producer writes all of the data to disk, it can then make a publish request to the headwater. The headwater exposes a simple REST interface, and the headwater and the data producer must live on the same host because they're going to share the disk. Once that headwater receives the request, it can then take ownership of the data. That means it's going to hard link a copy of that data into a directory that it owns, and it's going to make all of those underlying files read-only. And the purpose of making it read-only is to try to minimize accidental update to that data after it's been accepted for publishing. Once Headwater has its own reference to that data, it can reply back to the data producer that it will make that, that data available for consumers. At that point, the data consumer can safely delete its own reference to the data, uh, it can start writing new data, and it can do all of these things safely without interfering with Headwater's ability to publish that data. At that point, Headwater now needs to start preparing to make that data available for others. So it needs to create that torrent metadata file. We intentionally do this after replying to the artifact producer because creating the torrent metadata file can actually take some time. It has to load all of the data into memory to create the hashes, and we want to minimize the latency of the response from the headwater. A river is the course the water carves across the landscape. We knew we needed to have some sort of a coordinator service that could connect consumers and producers, and so we named our coordinator service Rhone after one of the more important rivers in Europe. New slide, a diagram. A central box, Zookeeper, with three circles connected to it. Each, a Rhone. So our Rhone is a multi-master coordinator service. There are multiple instances of it running for resiliency, and they use Zookeeper to execute consensus protocol so that any instance of the Rhone can provide a consistent state of the world at all times. Our headwater can then use a simple REST interface to call out to that Rhone and ask it to publish this version of the data. To publish it means they're going to hand off the torrent metadata file so that the Rhone could make that data available to potential consumers. 
The Roan can keep a simple map to keep track of all of the versions of data and the torrent metadata file that describes that particular data artifact. And then it can accept uh, the published request back to the headwater. At this point, the Roan could provide that torrent metadata file so that any potential consumers could download the data. And the headwater can turn around and start seeding that data to the tracker so that there are some peers available and ready to provide data. But we still need a consumer. So a delta is the end of the river, and so our consumer process is named a delta. New slide, a diagram. A box called host, with the inner text, data consumer, delta. Data consumer has an arrow pointing to delta with the text, subscribe to data. It's somewhat analogous to a headwater in that there's a data consumer process, again owned by a development team at Indeed, that's going to make use of one of these data artifacts. The data consumer at startup makes a simple subscribe request to the delta that's on its local machine, announcing all of the data that it expects to be made available to it. The delta then needs to make sure that all subscribed artifacts are always available on the local disk. The system we've built up so far has a headwater with the data, it's seeding that information as a potential peer, and the Roan has the torrent metadata file stored in it that would facilitate a BitTorrent download. So the Delta can simply call out to the Roan and say that it wants to get the latest version of some particular data. The Roan replies back with the torrent metadata file, and the Delta can then go out, look up the info hash in that metadata file, talk to the tracker, get the peer list, and start initiating that data download. At some future time, the data consumer is gonna be ready to actually use the data, so it needs to know where to find it. And it can again make a REST API call to the Delta, asking where the latest data is on the disk. New slide. A box, host, containing Delta, data, and data consumer. Delta has an arrow pointing to data consumer with the text, it's at slash rad slash data. The delta can reply with where it stored the data, and at that point, the data consumer can just go to that location on disk and load the data and do whatever it needs to do. The delta needs to also be sure it can keep all subscribed artifacts current. So in the background, it's regularly calling out to the Roan to see if there's been any new versions of that data published. If not, then it's fine, and if so, the Roan can provide that new torrent metadata file, and the delta can go out and download it immediately and make it available for the data consumer the next time it asks to see if there's new data. So with these three services, the Headwater, the Roan, and the Delta, we can keep multiple ordered versions of artifacts available in our production infrastructure, and they can be downloaded to any machine that can communicate with the Roan. New slide, a diagram. Title, Artifact Availability Flow. Two host boxes, one with the Delta and one with the Headwater. A circle, Roan, between them. Arrows point from data producer to headwater, over to the Roan, across to the delta, and down to data consumer. This can all also happen without any intervention from our systems administrators. And the data consumer and the data producer are both still separate and independent uh, deployables to help increase the velocity of our development teams. So we wanted to think as much as possible about automatic recovery with RAD. As Jason described, the R-Sync system had a lot of times where our systems administrators needed to manually intervene to keep the data flowing. So what would happen if our headwater had accepted the data producer's request, but then crashed before it could provide that torrent metadata file out to the Roan? Or what if it had been able to provide the torrent metadata file to the Roan, but crashed before it could start seeding that data to the tracker? We wanted to make sure our systems were as resilient as possible against these types of scenarios because you know that they're going to happen. And so with that, we designed all of the systems in RAD with a development philosophy that we want to make recovery the common case. And what we mean by this is we want to make sure that the code paths that deal with recovery are the same code paths we're always using even when we're in normal runtime. We don't want them to be infrequently executed edge cases that might fall out of date or do something slightly different than the rest of the code. As well, we want to be constantly designing every line of code we write with, with recovery in mind. So there's a few techniques that we use to try and uh, do this. First, we store all of our state of the system on the file system. New slide, text, durable state with atomic file system operations. And that means that it's very important that the file system always be in a safe 
and valid state. However, writing data to the file system is just an inherently unsafe operation. You could be halfway through writing a directory to disk or halfway through your file stream, and if your process crashes, you're gonna be left with incomplete or corrupt data on your disk, which may be difficult to automatically recover from. So the way we avoid that is we always write data to the file system into a temporary location. So we open that temporary location, we write all of our data, and we ensure we safely finished writing that data. And in fact, we even ensure that the operating system has flushed its buffers so that the data is definitely durably stored on the disks. At that point, we can execute an atomic rename operation that moves that data into the location where it would be used. Doing file system operations this way ensures that our primary location for state is always either entirely safely in the previous state or has been entirely rolled forward into the new state. We never end up in a half in between state or incomplete update where the system wouldn't be able to continue operations. But that also means that we might occasionally redo work if we weren't able to finish our file system updates. So that meant we needed to ensure that all of our service calls were idempotent or that the same request could be made more than once and we'd be guaranteed to get the same result. And we wanted to make sure not only would the caller get the same result, but also that a request to publish the same information twice, for example, would not result in multiple versions being created or additional downloads being triggered. So by making sure that all of our service calls were safely idempotent and that all of our file system operations were done atomically, we're trying to ensure that our systems are as resilient as possible against process failures. We also want to make sure that RAD can handle network recovery. As Jason described, our sync is point to point and all of the data centers had one other primary data center serving their data. New slide, a diagram. Four boxes, DCs one through four. DC1 has an arrow pointing to each of the others individually. New slide. Title, no problem with BitTorrent Swarm. The four DC boxes now have interconnecting arrows pointing between them. However, in BitTorrent, every data center is already talking to every other data center. So if a single link goes down, that's just simply not a problem in this system. That data center already has that information provided from multiple other sources. And we also built into RAD that we treat each artifact independently. So that means the Delta is downloading all of the subscribed artifacts onto its disk in parallel so that a single large artifact is not going to choke up or back up the other small artifacts that might be needed on that machine. Along with trying to ensure our systems administrators weren't having to do a lot of recovery, we also wanted to empower our growing development team to take more ownership of creating their own replication flows. Let's take a look at what it was from a development perspective to add a new artifact into the rsync system. So you would write some new data producer, you'd run it into your QA environment, you'd test it, you'd be sure it was ready to go, and then you'd basically have to ask the systems administration team to do everything else. So they'd have to go figure out the machines that needed the artifact, set up the replication paths, possibly configure a new stream, and you just had to wait for that to happen. And as our development team was growing, this was becoming unsustainable. With RAD, when you want to add a new artifact, you still need to write that data producer and test it and be sure that it's doing what you expect. But when you want to then make that data ready and available for replication, you just simply declare it in the code. So the artifact producer makes a REST API call out saying to publish the data once it's finished writing it. The consumer on startup subscribes to the data artifacts that it needs and then asks for the location on disk when it's ready to make use of them. There's no manual intervention or configuration outside of the code that's required to ensure that that data flows from the producer to the consumer. New slide. Text. REST API is language agnostic. Also, because all of the services use a REST API for communication, that meant this system was available for all of our production applications, regardless of which language they might be written in. We also wanted to make sure we provided good system-wide visibility for anybody who was using this system. This was relatively straightforward. Roan already knew about all the artifacts. And in fact, it knows about each version of every artifact. New slide with a two-column table. Title, Roan stores list of versions by artifact. In the first column, artifact A, B, and C. In the second column, the versions. For example, text. Artifact A, versions 4, 5, and 6. 
Artifact B, versions 221, 226, and so on. So it would be pretty straightforward for the delta to identify whether or not it had the latest data available. And if for some reason it was unable to consistently download some particular version of data, it could proactively alert someone to this problem. But system-wide visibility is more than just knowing what artifacts exist. We also want to make sure we know how widely used each artifact might be. So to accomplish this, both the delta and the headwater send regular heartbeats to the Rhone. And they identify exactly which data artifacts they're using and, in fact, which versions of each artifact that they're using. And so with that, Roan has a complete system-wide view of all the data that's available in the system and exactly where that data is in use. And that's great that Roan has this view, but we want to make it easy for our development teams and our systems administrators to also see where this data is. New slide, a screenshot of a detailed developer dashboard. Title, Radar. Developers can easily see where their data is. So we built a web application on top of this kind of state information. We named it Radar. And Radar makes it easy for developers to see where their data is. Uh, this is a sample artifact details page. Uh, you can see it identifies the name of the artifact and the versions that are currently in use. The name is Geo. Text. Min active version, 13. Max active version, 15. You can see exactly which machines built each version of the data. And you can see exactly which consumers are using which version of the data. For example, for version 13, Radar lists the headwater as Ausmexec 7, whereas Ausmexec 10 built version 14. In another example, for data center Aus, the host is Aus App 8. So this provided pretty good visibility into exactly where your data is to both the developers and the systems administrators. So this is how we design software at Indeed. We want to start simple and iterate. So with these initial design goals handled, we wanted to get this code shipped into production and being used as quickly as we could so that we could start learning where else we needed to invest and what continued improvements we needed to make. So by the summer of 2014, we were able to migrate our first artifact to RAD in production. And we were able to start learning where the system limitations were. And what we quickly learned was you need to make sure that your systems prevent people from using them incorrectly. And in our case, we actually made configuration too easy. So now, any development team could ship code, ask for new data, this great new data set that they heard about, that maybe is 50 gigabytes, and it would automatically start being downloaded onto their local disk. And so the development teams could accidentally start filling up their disks in production without really realizing that that was going to happen when they shipped that code. So we added a new requirement to RAD, which was to make sure we always protected the disks. This was a relatively straightforward change. All we needed to do in the delta was make sure it didn't download artifacts that would fill the disk. And that's a you know, relatively straightforward thing to do, but we wanted to more than just not fill the disks. We wanted to make sure we left you know, some extra space. So the delta, before it starts downloading any given artifact, will first calculate exactly how many bytes that it needs and it will only download the data if there's sufficient disk space. If there's not sufficient disk space, it can proactively alarm and make sure and alert someone to this problem. So with that problem solved, we were able to start migrating more artifacts. And by the summer of 2015, the system was stable and reliable enough in production that we were able to migrate our first business critical artifact. And at that point, we turned it on as the default replication strategy so that teams who were writing new data artifacts needed to write them in the RAD system. And so by March of 2016, we had over 80 artifacts in RAD. A handful of these are some of the legacy rsync-based artifacts that we had migrated, but the vast majority of these were actually brand new artifacts that were created for the first time using RAD for replication. To get a sense of the developer velocity that that enables, uh, the first 10 years at Indeed, we had been able to create about 100 artifacts, but in under a year since we've turned on RAD, there's already been almost 80 new artifacts created. Uh, some other stats, I wanted to get an idea of the volume that was going through RAD every day. So for a 24-hour period on a day last week, there were 56 unique producers of data that published over 7,000 unique versions of data into the RAD system. New slide. Title, RAD Stats. March 23, 2016. Text. Producer, 7,666 versions published. 
Consumer, 52,357 versions downloaded. 670 unique consumers. And we have 670 deltas that are running in production, and those deltas were responsible for over 52,000 version downloads onto machines across our infrastructure. As well, we were really hoping we would get some speed improvements with RAD, and so here's an example of our job index replication. Uh, the top line is the time our job index replication took using the rsync system, and the bottom line is the same day but with RAD. New slide, a line graph. Title, duration of job index replication in RAD versus rsync. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. on January 18th and 19th, it measures 1,000 to 3,000. The R-Sync line spikes over 1,000 at 6 a.m. on January 18th and over 3,000 at the same time the next day. The RAD line has relative spikes but always stays well below 1,000. Most of the day, our job index has small incremental updates with just the changed or new jobs. But once a day, we do kind of a cleanup process on our index, which will cause the entire large artifact to be re-downloaded. So you can see here with RAD, most of the day when we're doing the small incremental updates, it's about two to three times faster than the rsync system was. And during that daily whole index redownload, it averages three to five times faster, but as you can see from this day I happened to pick, uh, it was substantially faster on this one day. These two systems together, the rsync system, which is still supporting some of our legacy artifacts, as well as the RAD system, which is now the standard way that developers add new artifacts into our system, are how we are replicating over 65,000 terabytes of data every month here at Indeed. And if you'd like to learn more about some of the things that we've talked about in past talks or some of the problems that we're solving, uh, here are some links that you can go check out. Slide title, learn more. Text, engineering blog and talks, indeed.tech, open source, opensource.indeedeng.io, careers, indeed.jobs, Twitter, at indeedeng. Logo, indeed.